Thank you for coming today. We have a really great turnout here. Thank you for coming. And my name is Robert Grillo, for those that don't know. And I'm the director of Free From Harm. And I plan on doing these, hopefully, more workshops and events like this. So if you want to sign up for similar events, you can go to freefromharm.org and sign up there. So without further delay, please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Melanie Joy. so happy to be here. I was saying to my friend yesterday, actually, I was saying, oh my god, I've got to fly, I've got to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to fly to give a talk, and I, I usually don't get up till 9 or 10, and I said, but, but I'm going to Chicago, thank god. I'm going to, I've been speaking all around the world, and I can say with absolute certainty that, that speaking in Chicago, it, this is actually my well, this is caught on film. One of my favorite, all-time favorite places to talk. And I knew that coming here would actually recharge me as opposed to draining me. And so I'm like, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so excited. The energy of the community out here is it's really magical and it's really special. Um, and I hope that you're aware of that. I can tell you from my perspective, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to be connected with you all and a part of this. Um, so I was going to just mention the structure of today. So I'm going to talk for 45 minutes to an hour and just go over the ideas and speaking truth to power um, and we'll have some interaction during this. Um, and then after that we'll have a Q&A for about a half an hour and then after Q&A we're going to have food, is that correct? Um, and um, so during, while there's food, I'll do a book signing as well. And we're also, we're filming this for two reasons. One reason is because we really wanted to be able to put this presentation online so that other activists would have access to it. Um, the other reason is because we are um, working on a documentary, um, documentary film of my work on carnism, of me and my work. And so this will be integrated into the documentary. So that being said, so let's get started. Um, and can you hear me back there okay? All right, great. So, um, so today I'm going to be talking about the dominant animal eating narrative, which is really just the stories that create and are created by the dominant animal eating culture, and about the impact of these stories on ourselves and our world. Now, recognizing these stories is really central to the empowerment of us as individuals, but also of our movement. And the foundation for this empowerment is what the Quakers refer to as speaking truth to power. So to help explain this concept of speaking truth to power, I'm going to share a story with you. As many of you are probably well aware, through the first half of the 20th century, women and girls were considered mentally and physically inferior to males, and thus destined for a life of domestic servitude. So many women lived lives of tedium and isolation. They were cut off from the vibrant social world around them, and yet they obligingly submitted to their fate. But then in the 1960s, something happened. Women started talking with each other about their feelings and experiences. And over time, these conversations led to the establishment of formal discussion groups. And as more and more women shared their stories, they recognized that many of them were having similar experiences, such as being physically and emotionally abused by their husbands. They realized that they weren't inferior, they were oppressed. So these groups empowered women to speak out against their oppression. They empowered women to speak truth to power. And they helped launch the modern women's liberation movement, which was a global movement and it was to change the course of history. Now, I use this story as an illustration because there are important lessons in it for all of us who seek to cultivate, cultivate more personal empowerment and social justice. Stories shape our lives and our world, for better or worse. For instance, when the women believed the stories of the dominant sexist culture, when they looked at themselves through the eyes of men in that time, they believed that their own personal deficiencies were to blame for their lower social status. But when they shared their own stories, they recognized that the problem was not rooted in themselves, but in external power structures. 
And stories can be fiction or fact. For example, the story that women were inferior because they were overly emotional, weak, and irrational was based on gross distortions about women's true nature and experience. It's a fiction, right? When women were able to share their own stories, they were able to share the truth of their own experience. True stories reflect our own internal truth. And widespread stories reflect and reinforce a widespread ideology or a belief system. So for instance, the story that women were inferior didn't come out of nowhere. It reflected the widespread ideology of sexism. And the more men and women alike bought into this story, the more they reinforced the sexist system acting out and therefore confirming the stereotypes of dominant males and submissive females. So today I'm going to be talking about the widespread stories that our culture teaches us about eating and not eating animals, and about the widespread ideology that drives these stories. Now, many vegans are aware of the fictions that are spun by the dominant animal eating culture. I mean, vegan advocacy is organized around providing truthful alternative stories. But there are some stories that many vegans are unaware of. And these stories can cause us to feel frustrated, isolated, despairing, and they can seriously undermine our advocacy. But when we become aware of these stories, we can rewrite them and we can transform our, our despair into inspiration and significantly empower our movement. Because when we change our stories, we change our lives and our world. Now, I want to talk very briefly about this ideology that drives the stories of the dominant animal eating culture. And a lot of you here, I know, are already familiar with my work. So I'm going to go over this, this point just very briefly as kind of a, a refresher and for people who haven't heard about my, my work on carnism yet. Now, we tend to assume um, in this culture and in many animal eating cultures around the world that, that there is no ideology of the dominant animal eating culture. We tend to assume that it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table. But most of us don't learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, because we don't have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. So when eating animals is not a necessity for survival, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. So carnism is the term that I've been using since 2001 to describe the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. It's essentially the opposite of veganism. Now, carnism is a global phenomenon. Anthropologists have found that in meat-eating cultures around the world, people tend to have a tiny handful of animals out of thousands of possible species that they learn to classify as edible. All the rest they classify as inedible and disgusting, often even offensive to consume. Carnism is also a dominant ideology. That means it's woven through the very structure of society to shape norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And it also ends up shaping the very way that we think and feel about eating animals. And of course, it's a violent ideology. So carnism is truly a system of oppression. It is a system that is organized around a socially powerful, privileged group, humans, using a less powerful group, farmed animals, for their own ends. But people who participate in carnism, people who eat animals, also care about animals and don't want them to suffer. So carnism, like other violent ideologies, needs to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms so that humane people participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they are doing. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. So carnistic defenses essentially tell the stories that maintain the ideology in sort of a, a feedback loop that looks something like this. And this is an example of what that, can you see in the back? Okay, because I can read this out. Oh. Now, I'm going to be going over this in much greater detail so it will make more sense if it doesn't right now. Um, but 
If I'm not mistaken, isn't there a word for the fictions promoted by the dominant culture? Propaganda. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Now there are two kinds of carnistic defenses, primary defenses and secondary defenses. And people who are familiar with my work are, are somewhat familiar with primary defenses because that's what it's largely been focused on. Primary defenses essentially tell stories that validate, they exist to validate carnism. They tell stories that eating animals is the right thing to do. And this is an example. Secondary defenses exist to invalidate veganism, and this is actually going to be the focus of my presentation today. We can think of primary defenses as defensive and secondary defenses as offensive. We can think of secondary defenses essentially as offensive veganism. It's repression against the movement that challenges carnism. Secondary defenses tell the story that not eating animals is the wrong thing to do. Some of you may have heard of this book. I'm not recommending that you read it. It's not exactly well researched, among other things. Essentially, primary defenses distort the truth about farmed animals and non-vegans. For example, we learn to see animals as objects or to believe the myth, the fiction, that people need to eat animals. And secondary defenses distort the truth about vegans and veganism. So we believe the myth, for instance, that vegans are unhealthy. So let's look at primary defenses, just briefly. The main defense of the entire system is denial, expressed through invisibility. And one way carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, we can't even think about it, so we can't question it or challenge it. The invisibility of carnism is why eating animals appears to be a given rather than a choice. So one story that carnistic denial tells is that there is no belief system. It's only vegans and vegetarians who have a belief system. Everybody else is just, what? Normal. Yeah, normal. But carnism also keeps its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. So another story that denial tells is that, well, hey, there is no problem. If we believe there's no problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it. Another defense is justification. Now justification is a defense that tells many stories, many myths, and there's a vast mythology surrounding eating animals, but all of these myths fall under uh, the th what I refer to as the three ends of justification. That is, eating animals is, we could even say this in chorus, Okay. Oh, you've read my book. Um, <laughs> normal, natural, and necessary. Interestingly, I actually do this. Um, I, I do this exercise with. I've, I've been giving this carnism, my carnism presentation, which is for a mediating audience or a mixed audience, actually, around the world. And I, I do this exercise with those audiences as well. And people usually get it within seconds. Seconds. It's amazing because we've heard it all before. Of course, these same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout human history. And finally, carnism uses a set of defenses that distort our perceptions of animals and their flesh and excretions, eggs and dairy products. Um, so that we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. For instance, we learn to view animals as objects, as things. We learn to view animals as abstractions, as lacking in any individuality or personality of their own and simply as abstract members of a group. A pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. And of course, like other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. And we learn to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can harbor very different feelings and carry out very different behaviors toward different species. Now, vegans often have an intuitive understanding of primary carnistic defenses. I mean, much of our vegan activism is organized around highlighting, illuminating these defenses, right? And telling the truth. So for example, think about um, you know, making the invisible visible, challenging carnistic denial. You, some of you might be familiar with the 10 billion lives tour that Farm is running, or pay-per-view. People are paid to watch you know, a four-minute video of, of animal slaughter. Or 
challenging categories, you know, Mercy's um, campaign, asking why we eat some animals but not others. Or validating the individuality of farmed animals. Jenny Brown of Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary, right? Many vegans have an intuitive understanding of primary defenses because we have an intuitive understanding that non-vegans, and when, I re when I'm saying non-vegans, I mean people who consume generally meat, um, that non-vegans are looking at the world through the lens of carnism. We recognize this. But what we often don't recognize is that we are also often looking at the world through the lens of carnism, through the sphere of secondary defenses. And that's what I want to be focusing on today. How do secondary defenses impact us as vegans, impact the way that we understand and relate to ourselves and others and our world? Now, secondary defenses exist to invalidate the stories that challenge carnism. They exist to silence those of us who would speak out against the carnistic fictions, who provide alternative truthful stories. They invalidate stories that challenge carnism in one way by invalidating vegans ourselves. They also seek to invalidate vegan ideology and practice. And secondary defenses also exist to invalidate the vegan movement as a whole. And I'm going to talk about each one of these and give examples of the way that, that carnism does this. But first, I want to point out that secondary defenses are often a sign of a backlash. A backlash is a reaction of the dominant culture to threats to its power, to threats to the status quo. And for that reason, it's very important for us to recognize that secondary defenses evolve and intensify as the vegan movement evolves and intensifies. So they are a sign of our success, not our failure. I cannot tell you how many vegans, thousands of vegans around the world I talk to, who when they encounter secondary defenses feel so defeated and get so despairing, thinking, my God, for example, despite all of our efforts to raise awareness, we have to contend with happy meat now? I mean, what's going on? But it's not despite our efforts, it's because of them. This is a really good sign, reason to celebrate. We'll come back to happy meat, uh, happy meat in a little while. So one secondary defense is projection. Projection invalidates vegans, and therefore it invalidates our message. It makes us wrong. Vegans, it tells the story that vegans are wrong. If we shoot the messenger, we don't have to take seriously the implications of his or her message. Now, one kind of projection has to do with the qualities of carnistic culture. So, for example, vegans may be portrayed as possessing the undesirable uh, qualities of the culture. We might be called biased or extremist when we challenge the biases and extreme practices of the dominant culture. I can't tell you how many vegans tell me that they're called biased every time they share information with the assumption that carnistic information somehow is objective. Or we may be um, portrayed as lacking the desirable qualities of, of the culture. So for example, we may be called overly emotional or sensationalist when we challenge the apathy and numbing of the culture. Now, if we don't recognize these projections for what they are, we can actually end up believing in them and buying into them, right? So, for example, we can end up believing that we're being overly emotional instead of recognizing that our emotions of sadness, grief, anger at the atrocity that is animal agriculture are, in fact, appropriate, healthful, legitimate responses to what's happening in the world. When it comes to animal exploitation, the world needs much more emotion, not less. Also, if we don't recognize these projections for what they are, we can end up projecting back onto meat eaters and kind of get engaged in this battle of projections. Can anyone relate to this? Another 
anachronistic projection reduces us to shallow vegan stereotypes. So, for example, if we advocate peace, we are tofu-loving, tree-hugging hippies. And if we express our anger, we are militant human haters. Can anyone relate to any of these? Right? And so what ends up happening if we don't recognize these projections for what they are is we can buy into them and start acting them out and sort of be, we can become them and act them out in sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and therefore confirm the distortions, the distorted stories of carnistic culture. Now don't get me wrong, I, there's nothing wrong with being a, a hippie, but there is a problem with being reduced to nothing other than a one-dimensional stereotype. Now, often, carnistic culture projects onto us an image of omnipotence, suggesting that we only have a right to our ideology if we can live up to an impossible ideal. So, we're expected to be paragons of health. For instance, raise your hand if you have ever hidden the fact that you're sick from a meat eater, or, but you, don't even, you already know where I'm going, <laughs> from a meat eater or a non-vegan because you were worried that they would use your illness as a reason to discredit your ideology. Can you relate to this? Okay, I rest my case. <coughs> or we're expected to be paragons of virtue with the moral consistency of the Buddha. So if we don't want to wear a used wool sweater, we're extremists. But if we do wear the sweater, we are, you know where I'm going with this too, we're hypocrites, we can't win. And we're expected to be experts on everything. I mean, agricultural economics, organic, veganic, hydroponic, <laughs> mushroom farming, quantum physics. It's as if we only have a right to advocate veganism if we somehow have all the solutions to the problem that is carnism. And when, of course, we don't live up to these projections, then it becomes an excuse to discredit everything we stand for. What pressure on us? I mean, we become the token vegan, you know, the ambassador for the entire movement. If we buy into the fictitious story that we can and should live up to some perfect ideal, then when we don't turn everybody around us vegan, we can feel that we are somehow personally responsible for animal suffering, right? In our vegan minds, we become animal murderers. You can relate to this, right? I can tell. I mean, talk about role reversal, though. Really, this is the way carnistic projections work. They turn the problem of carnism around and pin it on vegans. Now, some vegans actually end up internalizing this projection and believing that they are all-powerful or that their particular brand of veganism or vegan advocacy is the perfect ideal. And then they can end up projecting onto other vegans who don't agree with them that the other vegans are imperfect and wrong. Um, now, this kind of righteous attitude leads to fundamentalism. And, you know, fundamentalism is a problem that plagues activists from all social movements, not just vegans. Now, a final projection that I want to talk about is that of the physically or mentally ill vegan. Now, fortunately, thanks to the work of many medical practitioners and vegan advocates and activists, the stereotype of the malnourished, sickly, weak vegan is quickly becoming a thing of the past. Today, in general, the conversation is not about whether veganism is a healthy diet or not. When we're talking about diet, it's, is it the healthiest diet in the entire world? It's interesting to see how it's shifted. Um, when I first went vegetarian many years ago and then vegan, my mother didn't think I was going to live to see 30. And, you know, and, and now when I tell people I'm vegan, they say, oh, oh, that's why you look so young, or oh, that's why you're so healthy. It's just amazing to see the difference in, in people's reactions. Um, but today it's still not terribly uncommon, for instance, for a psychologist to assume that a young woman's choice to become vegan is reflective of an underlying eating disorder. 
um, you know, thus pathologizing her. Now, pathologizing those who challenge the status quo is nothing new. African slaves who attempted to escape from slavery were diagnosed as having the mental illness drapedomania, because you'd have to be nuts not to want to be enslaved, right? Russian dissidents had been um, diagnosed with psychosis with counter-revolutionary hallucinations. Another carnistic defense or secondary defense is, is justification. We talked about primary justification and the mythology of that eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary, the three ends. Secondary justification tells a similar yet slightly different story. Secondary justification tells a story, guess what do you think it would be? The story that not eating animals is, what do you think? Abnormal, unnatural, and unnecessary. It's the reverse of the three ends. Now what's very interesting about justification is that it's taken on a whole new role um, in maintaining carnism. I believe that thanks to the efforts of vegan advocates and activists and to the advent of the internet, the main defense of the system, denial, has been sufficiently destabilized. So today, most people can no longer deny at least the most egregious practices of animal agriculture, right? So there's a greater need now to justify eating animals than ever before. And so what's happened is that each of these three ends has morphed into its own new ideology that I refer to as neocarnism. Now, I'm not going to get into this too deeply. I have an article that I'll refer to if you're interested in more information on neocarnism. But neocarnism basically reflects how each one of the three ends has become its own ideology. So we have eating animals as normal expressed through compassionate carnism. This is the so called happy or humane meat mentality where people may say, well, I want to do less harm, and this is a good sign. You know, we're getting people to ask questions. People who genuinely want to do less harm but they may feel that veganism is too radical. They don't want to step too far outside the carnistic norm, outside the mainstream. So then they um, engage in compassionate carnism instead. Eating animals as natural is organized around what I call echo-carnism, and we can see this in the sustainability movement, you know, at locavorism. Michael Pollan is a, a staunch advocate of, well, he wouldn't call it echo-carnism, but I do. And eating animals as necessary is organized around what I call bio-carnism. We can see this manifested in the, you know, paleo diet, for instance. This is often promoted by former vegans and vegetarians who, you know, may have not felt that well on their vegan or vegetarian diet have gone back to not just eating meat, but like embracing meat eating, embracing the consumption of animals in a whole new way. And each one of these targets um, one of the pillars of the vegan movement. Compassionate carnism reflects animal welfare concerns, echo-carnism reflects environmental concerns, and bio-carnism reflects health concerns. So if you're interested in more information about neocarnism, um, it's actually on my website now, carnism.com. If you go to carnism.com, we have this under resources for, for vegans. And finally, we come full circle to denial, which is the main defense of the entire movement. And as you'll recall, one story denial tells is that there is no belief system. But secondary denial takes this even further. Because if we believe that there is no belief system, if we believe that people who eat animals are acting outside of a belief system and outside of a dominant belief system at that, then we also believe the fictitious story that there is no dominant group. There is no majority group, right? And if we believe that there is no dominant or majority group, we also believe the opposite, which is what? There is no... Exactly. There is no subordinated or minority group. So one story that secondary denial tells, one fiction that secondary denial tells, is that vegans are not an ideological minority group. Now this story has serious implications. For example, raise your hand or nod your head, whatever you want to do, if you have ever been teased or mocked 
just for being vegan. And I don't mean in like a nice way, I mean in kind of a hostile way. Okay, so that's a lot of people in this room. It looks like it's just about everybody in this room. Now there is a word for being on the receiving end of hostility for no reason other than one's membership in a social group, isn't there? Harassment is defined as any physical or verbal conduct demonstrating hostility toward a person because of his or her race, sex, age, disability, religion, or other, in this case, legally protected status. And harassment, of course, stems from the mindset that breeds it, which is prejudice. I have talked to thousands of vegans around the world and heard their stories of feeling um, marginalized, of feeling isolated, of feeling apologetic in some ways for their core beliefs and their choices. And, um, and they don't recognize, very often they tell me, I, I thought it was only me. I thought I was the only one that had these struggles. When we recognize that we are part of an ideological minority group, it can empower us to, to stand up for ourselves and to speak out against carnistic prejudice and to educate others about carnistic prejudice because most if not all people who, who uh, espouse this prejudice are completely unaware that, of the fact that they're doing so. Now another story that as I mentioned before denial tells is that there is no system of oppression. Now, if we believe that there's no system of oppression, that there's no widespread systematic violence, then we also believe that animal agriculture is not an atrocity. It's not a mass trauma. This is not terribly different than the story the Nazis told when they said there was no Holocaust. And if we believe that animal agriculture is not a mass trauma, then we fail to recognize that animals are victims, animal agribusiness and industry are perpetrators, and vegans are witnesses. These stories have significant implications as well. For example, think about whether or not you have ever experienced, or you know and another activist or vegan advocate that you know has ever experienced any of the following, or directly related to your activism or your veganism. Depression, intrusive thoughts of animal suffering. Intrusive thoughts simply means thoughts that are coming into your mind unbidden, like you might just be going through your day and all of a sudden you have a flashback to like earthlings or something and you say, why did I ever watch that? Um, nightmares about animal cruelty. If you or anybody you know has ever experienced these. How about a loss of faith in humanity? Really questioning like, okay, you can really, <laughs> everybody's nodding at this one. Um, really questioning like, what kind of a species am I a part of? Like, how can I feel any sense of connectedness to my fellow and sister humans when I know what's going on in the world, when I know what they're doing? Irritability, and this is as a direct result, again, of veganism or vegan activism. Feeling like your activism is never enough. Feeling like you have a hard time giving yourself permission to just enjoy life and have fun because, hey, animals don't stop dying at seven o'clock, so why should I stop working at seven o'clock? Feeling guilty for enjoying yourself or not suffering when you're out having a good time, thinking about how hard what's going on for the animals and saying, well, who am I to be out having fun right now? I could be home, I could be leafleting somewhere. How about a little bit of burnout, maybe? Okay, it sounds like it seems like a lot of you can relate to this. So, now, what are the implications? What are the? I'm, I'm just curious, briefly, to hear your thoughts. What are the consequences for activists of having these feelings? What are the consequences on the movement? Yes. Um, I hang out on a site with a number of trolls. I was a little hypersensitive at one time, and I was just really mean and replying to somebody. I had an innocent question. I took him for a patrol, um, a carnist bully. 
you had to apologize later. I was just too hypersensitive. Oh, that's a really good good answer. So I'm going to just repeat it so everybody can hear. He was saying that he was on, on a website, right? You were in a forum, and um, somebody said something who was not a vegan, and, and you said you had a very strong reaction. You thought it was just a bully. You had a really strong reaction, and you ended up having to apologize later because you realized how reactive you had been. They right? So I shot him when I they, he said they were innocent, and I shot them when they shouldn't have. I shouldn't have. That's very honest of you. Um, but that's a very good example. When we, we become very reactive and very charged, and imagine if all vegans start to feel this way. We are, you know, how do we want to communicate our message? Yes. People give up. People give up. I have seen so many committed people, hardworking, committed activists that are really effective, burn out and leave the movement. The movement depends on us, and we are the movement. There are serious implications for this, and we can talk about this more during Q&A. But this is just to give you a sense of the way secondary denial works, and it's an incredibly effective tool in maintaining the carnistic system. Because what happens is we don't recognize that these are all symptoms of secondary traumatic stress. Secondary traumatic stress or secondary traumatic stress disorder is like post-traumatic stress disorder, except that it, in, it impacts witnesses to violence, not the direct vi uh, victims of violence. When we believe these carnistic fictions, we don't recognize that our response to witnessing an atrocity is a normal response to being a part of a mass trauma because we don't recognize it as a mass trauma. And so if we seek help, I can't tell you again how many activists I know who have actually sought help for some of the symptoms of STS. And the therapists that they worked with, well-intentioned therapists, but who are actually you know, active proponents of carnism without even realizing it, don't recognize that the vegan is in fact traumatized. The good news is that when we recognize the signs and symptoms of STS or STSD, and even before then, they're totally, they're treatable and they're also preventable. Um, I always recommend this book called Trauma Stewardship. Taking care, it's an everyday guide to caring for self while caring for others. And it's for activists and it is a great guidebook for how to prevent and treat secondary traumatic stress and deal with some of these symptoms. And one of the most important things that we can do is to practice nonviolence towards self. Literally, to practice nonviolence towards self, to be compassionate enough to ourselves so that we give ourselves permission to not suffer when we don't need to be suffering. That one, one way to think about this, and one way that I find helpful to frame this issue because it plagues so many activists, is to define sustainability. Well, I can share with you the way that I define sustainability. I define sustainability as when my input, what I'm taking in, is commensurate with my output, what I'm putting out. If I'm giving out more than I'm getting back in return, I'm going to become tired, irritable, resentful, and frustrated. And you all are shaking, nodding your heads, and I can tell you relate to this. If you start to notice yourself feeling resentful when you're giving, when you're doing your activism or when you're giving, because everybody in this room is in some ways a giver. That's why you're here. That's usually a good sign that you're not getting enough. And it's okay to need to get enough back. We're, that's called normal, that's called healthy. We're animals too. So let's get back to secondary denial and the story that there is no system of oppression. Another thing, another story that we can buy into when we believe the story that there is no system of oppression is that we can end up believing that eating animals is simply a matter of personal ethics rather than the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive ism. I mean, imagine believing that owning African slaves had nothing to do with racism. So when we believe this story, we also believe the story that eating animals is not a social justice issue. This is a fiction. And that the vegan movement is not a social justice movement. When we believe these, we, you know, vegans and non-vegans alike fail to recognize that the vegan movement is part of a long tradition of social movements that have changed and continue to change.
change the course of history. So we remain disconnected with the other movements that we're naturally allied with and that we need to be connected to, in my opinion, for our own movement to be successful, but also in order to really kind of cre to, to really create the kind of world that we all seek to cultivate. Now, sometimes denial tells the story that there, there is no vegan movement or that the vegan movement is weak and ineffective. This, by the way, is a fiction, I promise you. We'll get to that. And we therefore believe that, well, vegans are powerless to make a difference. So if we buy into the fictitious stories of secondary denial, we will inevitably despair. We will feel disempowered, silenced, disconnected from ourselves and our movement, frustrated and isolated. But these are fictions. The good news is that when we recognize the carnistic fictions for what they are, we can transform our relationship with them. Carnism depends, on our buy, depends upon our buying into its fictions because this way it keeps us feeling less empowered and less motivated to really keep making the kind of difference that we are making and we can continue to make. When we transform our relationship, when we recognize the carnistic fictions for what they are, and we transform our relationship with them, we're in a position to practice proactive veganism rather than reactive veganism. Before I talk about proactive veganism, I'm going to talk a little bit about reactive veganism. When we're practicing reactive veganism, what this means is that we're believing in some or all of the carnistic stories and we're reacting to them. We've internalized carnism to some degree. We've, we're looking at the world through the lens of carnism to some degree. When members of minority groups or targeted groups internalize the negative messages that they hear specifically about themselves, this is referred to as internalized oppression. One of the stories that members of minority groups always hears is that our needs are less valid and important than the needs of those of the dominant group. So for example, maybe you've had this experience before. If you go to a family dinner, I can see your faces already. <laughs> If you go to a family dinner and you ask that the butter be kept out of the mashed potatoes or maybe be substituted with earth balance or something that tastes just like butter that comes from cow's milk and that need is seen as being less important than the need to have a traditional meal. When members of the dominant group internalize the messages of the dominant culture, this is referred to as internalized privilege. Messages, our needs are more valid and important than those of the so-called minority group. One way that internalized privilege gets manifested, a primary way it gets manifested, is through a sense of entitlement. We can see this through sort of a, a righteous anger that can emerge when one's needs are not given precedence over another. So, for instance, maybe you've had this experience before if you invite somebody who's not vegan to go to a vegan or even a veg-friendly restaurant with you and they feel controlled or slighted because there's nothing Thing they can eat on the menu. <laughs> and yet you may be invited to a steakhouse without any thought whatsoever to the fact that you will spend the night picking on iceberg lettuce surrounded by people dining on flesh offending your deepest sensibilities. So it's important to recognize though that carnistic privilege, you know, people who have internalized carnistic privilege, um, you know, non-vegans, are simply, simply um, reflecting the mentality of the dominant culture. This is not conscious. This is not done consciously and this is not done maliciously. The same way that we've internalized the messages of the dominant culture. Most of us have no idea that we're engaging in these particular dynamics. Now, often vegans have this experience as kind of an internal conflict 
between what we know to be true, which is that our needs are, are valid and important, that we deserve to be treated as equals, and what we've been taught to believe to be true, which is that our needs are secondary. And so we can find ourselves, for example, apologizing for inconveniencing people when we ask them to keep the cheese off the salad, and then resenting the fact that we have to do this in the first place, right? When we've internalized oppression, the feeling that goes along with that is shame. Shame is the feeling of being less than. We feel shame when we look at ourselves through another's eyes and we believe their version of reality over our own. So, for example, we may feel embarrassed or ashamed of our emotional response to animal suffering when we're called hypersensitive. Now, sometimes vegans respond to feeling shame or feeling ashamed by becoming overprotective. In, in this case, they refuse to look at the world through anybody else's eyes. They refuse to um, consider any versions of reality that challenge their own. They become grandiose. They flip into a state of grandiosity. Grandiosity is the feeling of being better than. And then in this case, when we're in a state of grandiosity, we can end up shaming others. We can end up invalidating their feelings and their experiences. We become a mirror of carnistic culture in this way. But when we step outside of the carnistic fictions, we're in a position to truly practice proactive veganism. This means that we can hold on to the authentic truth of our experience without invalidating others' experience in the process. So we therefore are able to approach situations with genuine curiosity, which is an open mind, and with compassion, which is an open heart. We're able to experience compassion for others, vegans and non-vegans, and also for ourselves. We're able, we're, we're able to forgive ourselves when we end up engaged in the dynamics of this universal system in which we are all enmeshed. And so when we practice proactive veganism, we are able to experience a true, a genuine sense of pride. And a sense of pride or a feeling of pride is necessary for activists from all social movements. I mean, just think of um, black pride or gay pride. And we now have veggie pride. And we have a lot to be proud of. So ultimately, when we recognize the carnistic fictions for what they are, we neither underestimate their power. As a powerful man once said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. But nor do we overestimate their power, because as an even more powerful man once said, all through history, the way of truth has always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it. Always. And we can recognize what is perhaps the greatest lie of all. The story that people don't care. The story that people eat animals not because they have been, not because their hearts and minds have been manipulated by a violent system that's outside of their awareness and that guides their food choices like an invisible hand, conditioning them to act against their core values, their own interests and the interests of others, but simply because they don't care. And this, I can assure you, is a lie. I have been in an incredibly privileged position over the past two and a half years. I'm on the third year now of an international speaking tour in which I give my presentation on carnism to large groups of non-vegans, of meat eaters, all around the world. And I hear their stories over and over and over again. And the stories that I hear from them are radically different than the stories that dominant culture tells.
At the end of my presentation, I hand out evaluation forms, and I'm going to share just a few comments with you from those forms. So despite what the carnistic fictions would have us believe, there really is reason to be very, very hopeful. And I'll share with you some information that I shared in my carnism presentation. The most recent poll, to my knowledge, measuring, uh, counting the amount of vegans and vegetarians has demonstrated that the number of vegans and vegetarians in the United States has doubled between 2008 and 2011. And this is a trend that we see happening everywhere in the world. When I travel around Europe and the United States and Canada, I have the opportunity to meet with people in positions of leadership in the movement in a variety of countries, in a variety of cities, and I hear the same thing everywhere I go. It's, the movement is literally just mushrooming. It's incredible to witness it. A recent Business Week article entitled The Rise of the Power of Vegan states that a growing number of America's most powerful bosses have become vegan. More and more leaders and celebrities are saying no to carnism. Ellen has her own website dedicated entirely to going vegan. Vegan cookbooks and restaurants and innovative foods are popping up everywhere. I mean, it's just amazing, and people know the term vegan now. And I mean, before, it was just a few years ago, one of the things that I hear from people in a number of different countries is it's literally been in the past three years that they've seen this explosion of vegan awareness and the movement really starting to take off. So the trajectory of the movement is heading in this direction, and um, as based on what we know about social change, there's no reason to assume that it's not going to keep heading in this direction and just increase in speed as it moves there. So I just encourage you all to remember and acknowledge that you, know, you are a part of something. We are all a part of something greater than our individual selves. We are a part of a social movement that I believe will be looked back upon one day as one of the, if not the, most important and transformational movements in human history. So do not let carnistic culture minimize your belief in your own power as an individual to make a difference. You, each and every one of you, is making a difference. Yes, the problem is enormous. Yes, animals can sit, continue to suffer and die. But you are what is standing between them and what would no doubt be a much, much worse fate. So I want to just conclude by saying to you, thank you. Thank you for all that you are and for all that you do. Because it's truly your stories, your stories that are my greatest source of inspiration. And so I want to just thank you for having the courage to speak truth to power and for enabling me to continue to do the same. Thank you. So um, I also want to encourage you to, um, Carnism Awareness and Action Network is my organization, CAN, and to come visit us at carnism.com. We have a lot of resources for vegans and vegetarians, and for non-vegans and non-vegetarians on the site as well. So, um, And we also now have CAN Europe, um, because there was a demand for, such a demand for Carnism Awareness work there, um, that we recently just opened up a branch of CAN Europe. So anybody you know 
who might be interested internationally can send them to our site and they can link there to Canada Europe.